The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Coming up on today's show, we talk with Assemblywoman Karinas Reyes, as she's from the 87th Assembly District on the New York Hero Act, and what to expect moving forward. Then also, we'll learn about a middle and high school-based curriculum designed to end teen relationship abuse, as well as empower young people. And then, we're going to discuss about how one company is adapting its services, providing COVID-19 testing and response. And also a little later on in the show, we'll learn about a center providing a nurturing environment where children can learn and develop through age appropriate activities. And then finally, we'll discuss alternative medicine treatments and the effectiveness of Easter medicine during the pandemic. So stay with us because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially to open i am darren jaime and today is wednesday february 17th and you're watching open a live and interactive program that brings the bronx and new york city straight to your tv sets we also want to encourage our viewers who are watching and thank them for watching on manhattan neighborhood network as open is being broadcast live simultaneously on the eminent channel we invite you to stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at bronxnet tv and don't forget about our website at bronxnet.org well a whole lot has gone on throughout the course of the past week, and certainly we can't take you through everything, but we can walk you through a couple of things with our Bronx updates. We start off with news concerning coronavirus. Pharmacies are now joining the front line in the fight against COVID-19. A federal program is primed to deliver over 26,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine directly to Walgreens, Dwayne Reed, Costco, and Rite Aid pharmacies every week. The New York City's Health Commissioner, Dave Chosky, says, quote, pharmacies are a trusted part of our infrastructure particularly for seniors who rely on them for medications and other services. These additional doses will be a lifeline for so many city residents. New Yorkers who are also eligible for the vaccines can look for appointments online at vaccinefinder.nyc.gov. Well, in other news, City Field opens its gates to administer COVID-19 vaccines as residents walk in to receive their first dose. Our Bronx Net reporter Jericho Tran joins the excitement, learning more about the process. Jericho joins us now with the story. The gates for City Field opened, but fans aren't taking themselves to the ball game. Instead, residents walked into the stadium to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was it was very smooth, uh, very organized. Um, people, the staff were very helpful. Kay Camberkiss brought her 82-year-old mother to receive the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. The city plans to distribute 50% of the vaccines to Queens residents, with taxi drivers and food service workers from all five boroughs receiving the remaining 50%. Oh, it's very, very good organization here. And very good to know the direction to get inside the vaccine. And our organizer security is very wonderful. And while residents weren't there to cheer on their favorite team, Team, this Queens resident still felt the excitement to receive the vaccine. I got the vaccine. I'm very happy. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to home. So <clears throat> I got the vaccine. So maybe I am not 
I'll to take a rest at home. So. The city plans to expand service at City Field to 24 hours a day, seven days a week once they receive more vaccines. The Long Island Railroad will stop at Mets Willits Point along the Port Washington line to increase accessibility to the site. Now, before visiting City Field to get that vaccine and possibly strike out COVID, make sure you make an appointment before arriving. To make an appointment, please visit nyc.gov slash vaccine finder. Reporting for BronxNet, Jericho Tran. And thank you, Jericho. That is all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We'll continue to update you on the latest concerning coronavirus news and vaccines as well as sites. That and more you can find right here on Open. But right now, we're taking a quick break, and we'll return right after this. There's a special election on Tuesday, March 23rd. And if you live in any of these neighborhoods, you'll want to pay attention. Your councilman, Andrew Cohen, is now a judge, and there are five candidates looking to replace him. Whoever wins on March 23rd will join New York City's primary lawmaking body making decisions that affect you, your family, your home, and even your workplace. Starting in 2021, New York City will use ranked choice voting in primary and special elections for local offices. Ranked choice voting simply means that voters can rank up to five candidates in order of preference, instead of casting a vote for just one. You can still vote for just one candidate if you prefer. You can learn everything there is to know about the District 11 City Council race and the candidates by visiting Ballotpedia.org and RiverdalePress.com. Stay informed, and most importantly, make sure you mail your absentee ballot the day before Election Day on March 23rd, or safely head out to the polls to have your vote count and your voice heard. And welcome back. Senate Deputy Leader Michael Giannaris and Assemblymember Karinas Reyes have recently announced the New York Health and Essential Rights Act. The critical bill also requires businesses to have enforceable safety standards to prevent further spread of the coronavirus. The New York Hero Act would require the Departments of Labor and Health to implement enforceable minimal standards for workplace safety. The regulations must include protocols on testing, PPE, social distancing, hand hygiene, as well as disinfection and engineering controls. The question is, what can we expect moving forward? Here now to share a little bit more on the details is the District 87 Assembly Member, Karina Reyes, and uh, Assemblywoman Reyes, good to have you here and back here on Open. Hi, Darren. Happy to be back. Good to see you. Thank you. So walk us through a little bit of this here, because, of course, you yourself, and first of all, thank you for the work that you've done on the front lines, literally, not as just as an elected official, but literally uh, working in the hospitals for uh, during this time of coronavirus. But I know this is a bill that really is very special to you. So share with us what you're hoping to accomplish through this. Yeah, so the, the reality is that uh, this bill creates airborne precautions for all industries and all workplaces. And the reality is that unless you work in a healthcare setting, you don't have any um, health and safety standards around airborne infectious diseases. And the reality is that um, through COVID-19, we've seen kind of like a haphazard response um, from, from the state and from the federal government as to what, some of, what should be the precautions that businesses should take to reopen safely, to protect their workers, to protect the customers and the overall community. Um, so because there aren't any standards in place, it's just CDC guidelines and people apply them however they see fit. We believe that um, to be proactive and to protect not just the safety of workers, essential workers, but the overall community and customers that uh, we should have moving forward airborne precaution health and safety standards that um, businesses can apply to their individual industry. Um, the bill also creates um, uh, worker committees, which allows the actual workers to um, provide input into what those those precautions will be and how they will be implemented in their in the individual work workplaces. Um, and it also creates an enforcement mechanism because the reality is that currently um, with the CDC guidelines, there is no way for the Department of Labor or the Department of Health to enforce uh, precautions and we don't know if businesses are actually uh, providing those precautions and providing the necessary PPE for their workers and their customers. We've heard from business owners and we've talked to people in business improvement districts a little bit about the challenges for business owners. Some people already feel overwhelmed because of the loss of business. Others say, listen, you know what, we're trying to just get our business back 
having the necessary funds for PPE supplies and stuff like that. So talk to us about if you're a business owner, uh, is there any assistance that's available in helping business owners to be able to have the necessary supplies so they don't end up on the wrong side of this legislation? Yeah, so currently the legislation just talks about the standards, but that's definitely something that we could talk about moving forward because once once those standards are implemented, then we could create um, a mechanism for the state to be able to provide that PPE or, or make it more accessible for them. But I know I know for some businesses, and this is what we've heard back in some industries, they find this to be an unnecessary burden. Um, but the reality is that not every um, employer is a good actor. We're going to have people who, who are going to cut corners and, and by doing so are going to put people's lives on the line. So we want to create the standards. And if you're a business that's been following the rules and doing everything that you can to keep your, your, your workers safe and customers safe and the community safe, then by all means, you're going to be fine, right? But if you are, if you are um, an industry or an employer who unfortunately hasn't been doing everything possible to keep people safe, then this is going to feel like, like an like a new burden on you. But the reality is that we can't cut corners when we're talking about people's lives. Yeah. Look, let's switch fronts for a minute. New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo did uh, make a recent allocation talking about $90.4 million in state funding uh, awarded the 20 projects to house New Yorkers who are experiencing or at risk of homelessness. We know that homelessness is a big issue here in the borough, uh, supportive housing, a big issue in the borough. Do you feel as though uh, this will be a benefit, if you will, to Bronxites? I mean, any cent that comes to the Bronx is helpful. Um, unfortunately, that number is not enough. And it's not a number that we think um, is sufficient to address the needs of supportive housing, homelessness uh, that we're facing currently. Uh, we are in the process of, of putting together the state budget. The governor presented his executive budget. We uh, just last week finished reviewing all aspects of it. Uh, and we're in the process of putting together our one house budget. The Senate puts together their budget. And by April, we pass we're expected to pass what is a state budget. Granted, the, the executive budget had um, significant cuts across the board to supportive housing and a lot of supportive um, uh, projects and, and services, social services that our community uh, benefits from, but even more so now with the deep need that we've seen um, post COVID or during COVID uh, with loss of, loss of income, loss of employment, um, remote learning, all the need for social services. And the governor has done an across the board 5% cut on everything. Um, so we are relying on, on not just money that's been, gonna be coming from the federal government, but also uh, re revenue raising uh, measures. Uh, we believe that it is time for us to raise uh, taxes on, the, on the, some of the top earners in our state. We've seen millionaires and billionaires uh, exponentially increase their wealth during COVID when, when so many people in our communities have, have been suffering. So it is time for us to, to um, e equalize our tax structure and have them pay a little bit more. And that would be a way for us to fully fund all the services and social services that we need, including programs for supportive housing and building new supportive housing um, and making sure that we fund education and fund health care and not make cuts to Medicaid at a time when so many people are relying on it. Are you satisfied with the rent uh, moratorium, the fact that you cannot see evictions uh, for a longer period of time? Obviously, a lot of people uh, in your community have a lot to deal with rent uh, and, and, and renting uh, apartments. Are you satisfied with the uh, pushback as far as the moratorium? Well, I'm not completely satisfied. So I was the, the author of the uh, blanketed moratorium bill that got chopped up and turned into a huge omnibus piece of legislation. Um, but my original bill uh, had a moratorium that extended for a year after the emergency order was lifted. And that bill was also coupled with another piece of legislation that would create a fund to pay for uh, rent Back, back old rent. So we are currently in the process. Uh, so the current, the current eviction moratorium only is extended to May 1st. Um, and, and perhaps at that time, we'll have to revisit whether, whether another eviction moratorium is gonna be needed depending on what the current situation looks like. But also we realize that we can't just stop evictions and not uh, address the issue of back old rent. Um, particularly for landlords, we understand that landlords also have to maintain their properties pay taxes, pay uh, utilities. Um, so we want to make sure that we create a fund where landlords can access 
uh, those monies of back rent. And we wanna be able to, to make sure that we make them whole and that people are no longer owing rent once the eviction moratorium is, list, is lifted. Because what we don't wanna have is um, a huge wave of evictions after May 1st. Yeah, uh, last question before I throw out of here is to uh, ask you a little bit about CUNY. I know that there's legislation uh, and a plan in place to really assist CUNY students. Uh, you've been at the forefront of that. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, so I introduced a piece of legislation along with um, Senator Andrew Bernardes um, that would create a new deal essentially for CUNY. Um, it is a $1.47 billion investment over five years that would create a uh, tuition-free CUNY for um, New York State, the New York City residents. Um, and it would create, it would pay for more um, professors, for more mental health counselors, um, and for more uh, social workers and counselors overall. So we want to not just um, eliminate tuition like it was before 1975, because my, you know, my dad always talked about when CUNY was free. Um, but also make sure that we have the staff necessary to address the growing needs of, of our student body. And are you optimistic about it moving forward? I am optimistic. It looks like there is a, a significant infusion of money coming from the federal government that's earmarked for CUNY. Um, and like I said, if we're able to raise revenue along with this money, it, it, I am optimistic that this is something that could get done this year. All right. And what about the state budget before we leave? I know you guys are working on it. Optimistic it'll be on time? You know, this year is uh, unprecedented. And I think that we have a lot of people and, and not necessarily willing to compromise on the important things. And I think that that may mean that we may not pass an on-time budget. Well, we'll continue to follow and see what happens. Uh, Assemblywoman Karina Reyes, thank you for being with us here on uh, Open and best wishes to you. And thank you again for the work that you're doing. I can't leave without asking this. Talk to us and give us an update. I mean, your front line's in the hospital. Uh, you work in a hospital system. Uh, Bronx has been the highest hit of all the boroughs as far as COVID. Give us an inside look as to what you're seeing. Yeah, so it's definitely not what it was uh, back in March and the spring and early summer. Um, we did see an increased number uh, in, pay, in hospitalizations right after the holidays, right after Thanksgiving. I, I was there and I was there um, over December and the Christmas break, um, but it's definitely nothing like it was back in March. Um, so the numbers are decreasing. Um, people are still sticking to uh, the precautions of social distancing and wearing masks and washing their hands. But what we saw that when we saw that spike, it was, it was uh, directly correlated to, to behavior, right? people congregating for the holidays, um, eating together, spending time together and not sticking to those social norms, the, the social distancing and, and those precautions. And we saw those spikes. So we wanna make sure that people continue to take those precautions moving forward. All right. Someone Korean Korea as we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us here on Open. And again, thanks for your work. Thank you, Darren. All righty. We want you to stay tuned because guess what? We do have more Open. Don't go anywhere. Open will return coming up right after this. the show february is teen dating violence awareness month and in the u.s one out of three teens will experience relationship abuse february is dedicated to offering them the support and resources while promoting healthy relationships by empowering young people in response uh urban resource institute's relationship abuse prevention program is a middle and high school based curriculum that's designed to end teen relationship abuse 
and encourage young people. Joining us now to share more and provide further insight is the supervisor of the Relationship Abuse Prevention Program at the Urban Resource Institute, Liz Latsy. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Liz. Thanks for having me. Uh, glad to have you. Um, and I, and I, you know, when I looked at the beginning of the intro, it says one in three teens will experience relationship abuse. And that's a pretty startling number. Give us a little bit more about um, how relationship abuse is really prevalent in American society. Mm -hmm. Great question. And a perfect place for us to start, really. So at Urban Resource Institute, we run two programs. One, exactly like you said, the RAP program, Relationship Abuse Prevention Program. We call it RAP. And we also have Early RAP, the Early Relationship Abuse Prevention Program. And this is a prevention program where we, uh, clinical social workers and educators, get to go into schools. We reach about 40,000 kids in the New York City area. And we get to talk all about relationships. Now, exactly like you said, the numbers are staggering. One in three teens are going to be in some type of relationship abuse situation. And our entire program is committed to helping shake up those numbers and also to teach kids the healthy relationship skills that they need so they can go on and have healthy friendships, healthy relationships, and healthy families down the road. Yeah. So you have this program that deals with relationship abuse prevention. What goes into that program? For somebody who doesn't know exactly what is relationship abuse, particularly as a teenager, how would you define that? Great question. So we take what we call a true holistic approach, right? So we know that when we're working with kids and the data and the literature show this too, that we really try and get kids involved with their peer group. And one of our greatest strengths of the RAP and the early RAP program is that we get kids together in groups, in community organization, through education, through psychoeducational groups, and we start planting seeds about what relationship abuse really is. So for example, if you're a kid in middle school, then we're teaching you all about what we say the three types of abuse for middle school. So that's physical, verbal, and emotional types of abuse. And once we start getting into the teen world and into high schools, some of our programs throw in some clinical intervention. So we might have some therapy and our programs are run by uh, New York State registered clinical social workers. So we have individual counseling, group counseling, and we talk about physical, verbal, emotional abuse in addition to sexual harassment, sexual abuse, financial abuse, and something that is on everyone's mind, digital abuse. And there's also something called intergenerational abuse too. And uh, I became a little bit more familiar with that after doing a little bit of research, but uh, share with us a little bit about intergenerational abuse, because uh, what I understand about it is when you have that kind of abuse, it really plays out in the latter. We know that kids who witness abuse or witness domestic violence or kids who grow up where there is a story of domestic violence or abuse in the family are more likely to engage in those types of behaviors going on. So one of the beautiful things about the RAP programs is that we're really getting to the kids at the right age, right? So we probably know a lot of grownups who could use some healthy relationship skills, right? Mm -hmm. But we're starting with the kids because we need to start teaching them now how to recognize some of those red flags, how to recognize what it feels like when someone's pushing your boundaries and you feel uncomfortable, or we need to help kids understand about what might feel good in a relationship and what doesn't feel good and how to actually do something about that. So we're here to prevent abusive relationships and also to give kids the skills to be able to advocate for themselves in their own healthy relationships. Yeah. And Liz, one of the things I think that a lot of kids are, are dealing with now is we've got a generation that's addicted to technology, right? Uh, and in addition to the physical, we've got kids who are being bullied. We've got technology that actually plays a huge role in this abuse. Talk to us about the role of technology and what are we learning by way of abuse, particularly by way of technology in teens? Yeah, you know, Technology in teens is a double-edged sword, right? So we know that technology can do incredible things like 
For example, during COVID, we took our relationship abuse prevention programs completely online. We're still reaching 40,000 kids with our digital programming and our recorded content and doing live workshops, groups, and webinars and those types of things online. So we know that technology can be an incredible thing, especially during times like these when kids can't go to school, which for many kids was really the safe place for them. And we also know, like I said, the double-edged sword, the flip side of that is that what happens online can stay online forever. So one of the things that we help kids think about is how they want to act online, what they want to be able to see for themselves in five, 10, 15 years when they look themselves up on the internet, what do they want to have out there? And even more importantly, we teach kids about things like grooming and how to recognize if something dangerous is coming up for them online and what to do about it and really creating a safety plan if that were to come up. And Liz, I guess the optimal question is how do you go about getting your young people? Obviously, there are a lot of young people that really uh, can use these services and be impacted by these services. How do you go about getting them? Here's the most amazing thing about working in rap <laughs> is that we have the most incredible staff who love working with teens and kids. And I have to say, we do such powerful and deep work, but our work is fun. So we are in schools in all five boroughs of New York City. We got a bunch of schools in the Bronx and we engage kids in so many ways. So if we're in a school and we know that that school has a relationship with the arts, we have art programs, we have creative programmings, we have things like um, gay straight alliances in schools. We have kids who are doing leadership programming all with rap coordinators and all with these programs in the schools. So basically we get to go into schools and say, hey, what are the kids into in this community? And we do our absolute best to engage them in the way that they wanna be engaged. And honestly, it is so much fun. Yeah. And so I know that the work that you do has some lasting results. Talk about the impact that uh, it has when you have these conversations, when you bring this, when you bring this dialogue to young people, because, you know, let's be honest, when we talk about relationships, teens aren't necessarily so open about it. When we talk about abuse, anybody is overall, it's not so quick to talk about the abuse uh, incurred, but, but share with us what some of your results have been. Well, you know, you'd be surprised how much kids really do want to talk about this. And sometimes it's the grown-ups who feel uncomfortable about talking about this type of thing, right? Because, you know, grown-ups are still going through relationship things themselves. But when we ask kids the right questions, they are quick and excited to answer. Now, I hope it's okay to share this story with you. It's one of our mm -hmm. favorite stories that we have at URI. So in our early relationship abuse prevention program, it's made up of four educators who get to go into middle schools and they get to create and execute programming for our middle school students. Now, three out of our four workers, three out of our four workers actually are graduates of the RAP program. So that means that when these three incredible individuals were teenagers themselves, they were in high schools with the RAP program. And now they work for URI. Now they are the ones who are in the community, who are teaching about relationship abuse, who are sharing their own story. And to me, I mean, that is the biggest reward of all. We have seen how we change lives every day. And not only are we changing lives, but the lives we're changing are giving back to the community and they wanna keep this conversation going and still keep it at the top of mind for everybody, whether you're in the school system or at home or by yourself. Yeah, so before we go, talk to me about some upcoming events and what are you doing amidst COVID-19? Oh, well, you know, we really got our creativity hats on and we did everything we could to make sure that our students were still being served during COVID-19. So we've had online talent shows. We have run totally virtual summer leadership programs. We have done things like going on, believe it or not, field trips that are totally online. We have movie nights. We have things for caregivers. We have things for uh, training our staff. We have, you know, just sometimes kids just want to come on and play a game. So we make space to play categories with our students. So whatever we would be doing in school, we are totally doing online. And we always love to have kids involved. Well, Liz, thank you so much for coming and sharing with us. We're going to get people connected. Uh, and thank you for the great work that you're doing. Thanks for having us.
All righty, Liz Latte, our guest here. Now, listen, for more information, you can visit their website, urinyc.org, and follow them on Instagram and Twitter at uri uh, underscore nyc. Well, we do have more open. Don't go anywhere. We're going to return coming up right after this. Medical was originally formed to develop cancer and Alzheimer tests. Now the company is adapted to become a one-stop shop for COVID-19 testing and response. Their goal is to help save lives through early detection while being minimally invasive to the patient. In December of 2020, they released a supplement targeting coronaviruses called Tolovid and a software system for doctors to evaluate a patient's immune system before being vaccinated. Here now to share more is the CEO of Totals Medical LTD, Gerald Comision, and Gerald, welcome here to open. Thank you, thank you for having me. All right, thank you, and uh, listen, as we talk about coronavirus, obviously a lot of us are still in that phase of trying to navigate and get through it. We're glad that there's a vaccine out there, but you've also are working with a supplement. So uh, for those who don't know, give us a little bit about Tolovid. Sure, so Tolovid is uh, developed from a natural plant. The uh, plant has been used uh, for a long time in traditional Chinese medicine. Um, what it has is a very specific ingredient extract inside of it that targets something called the 3CL protease. If you think about how viruses work, they have to multiply and then they have to divide and then they have to leave the cells that they infect to go and infect other cells, other hosts. So what this 3CL protease does is it's effectively the food that the viruses need to continue to replicate and to divide uh, and go out and infect other cells. So this supplement that we have targets that 3CL protease and inhibits its activity, effectively seeking to cut coronaviruses off at the knees so they cannot replicate as readily as they otherwise would, giving the body's immune system more time to address and overcome the coronaviruses. Where are we with the supplement now? And uh, talk to us about some of the responses you've gotten since, uh, since uh, bringing the supplement forward. Sure. So we, uh, the supplement was initially launched in Israel. So they've treated thousands of patients uh, in Israel uh, in uh, you know, ba basically open label studies. Uh, we have recently started a double blind placebo controlled clinical trial of extra strength Tolovid in hospitalized patients in Israel. Uh, here in the US, we have uh, brought Tolovid to market through our partners at the Alchemist Kitchen. And we are uh, in the middle of uh, really finishing out the marketing materials, getting some additional data, especially from that placebo controlled trial uh, and producing more quantity before we start to mass market it. Yeah, and so as with the mass marketing, what are, you, are you looking at, what kind of timeline are we looking at in terms before we can really see it with a full rollout? Uh, we're thinking you know, towards the end of the first quarter would be our major marketing push. Uh, we see you know, a lot of opportunity for Tolovid uh, for people, obviously, who are not priority for vaccinations, as well as people who are undergoing the vaccination process and starting to get out into the universe, uh, we think that this could give an extra layer of protection, you know, while their immunity is building up from the vaccine. And I know, so the other work that you continue to do is uh, with regards to software. There's a software that's now uh, becoming available for doctors to evaluate a patient's immune system um, before being vaccinated. Give us a little background into that. Sure. So, you know, we've been talking about antibody tests 
for COVID-19 for, you know, upwards of a year. There was a lot of activity around it um, and then, you know, kind of went away. And now with the vaccine, there's a lot of interest coming back. Basically, um, the problem with a lot of the uh, tests that are out there is they're only looking for one thing uh, or two things um, that are very specific. They're not looking at a, a broader score. So just to put into context, typically you would look at, um, you know, three different antibodies um, and then the antibodies would work on different targets. You know, we've been hearing about the spike protein because there are a lot of variants in the spike protein. And so you may produce an antibody to the spike protein, uh, but if there's a variant that causes that antibody not to work and you don't have antibodies for other proteins related to the coronavirus, you could be at risk. So what this test does is it looks for, you know, the different antibodies, but on multiple antigens. It looks at the spike protein, it looks at uh, the N protein and the RBD protein. And so even if you don't have protection against the spike, if you have protection against other proteins related to that coronavirus, you may in fact still be immune. Looking at um, a profile rather than just one or two data points is really what's important as we think about the path to immunity for patients. How have doctors received your software? Uh, it's very well received. In fact, we've got a celebrity endorsement uh, from our partners at Aditext by Dr. Drew, who he himself took an antibody test um, in uh, you know the fourth quarter of last year. In the middle of the fourth quarter, showed he had antibodies, so he thought he had immunity. He did the Aditext score. We basically told him, you know, you don't have immunity. And uh, a few weeks later, he ended up getting COVID. Uh, and then followed his journey through getting COVID and then after recovery and really seeing those antibody levels go up uh, across the board. So, uh, you know, that was a real world example where some of the data out there with existing antibody tests gave someone a false sense of hope, whereas we gave him something that was much more comprehensive. And then, you know, you can always change your, uh, your choices based upon that information. And with the software, uh, how readily available is it now? Uh, so it was launched on February 1st. Uh, it is available. Uh, doctors are able to prescribe it. Um, and we are taking it so that, you know, the rollout is relatively slow on the marketing standpoint. But in terms of its availability, it is, you know, now available. And so we are in the middle of ramping up our marketing efforts now that it's on the market. Wow. Well, certainly we want you to come back and give us an update. Now, for people who want more information or get connected to the work that you're doing, uh, how do they go about doing that? Uh, so you can visit the company's website, todoscovid19.com. That's T-O-D-O-S, covid19.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at todosmedical.com or on our Facebook page, Todos Medical. Well, certainly want to thank you for being with us here on Open, and uh, it's been great having you. Uh, continue to let us know more as uh, the work continues. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We encourage you, please don't go anywhere. We got more show. Open continues right after this. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. There's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people it's gonna go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. And welcome back to the show. The Early Childhood Center is a nationally accredited state-of-the-art service facility in BCC serving two to five-year-old children of students. The center provides a creative learning environment where children can learn, play, and grow with other children in a group setting. 
Now they educate, also advocate and provide support and expertise, empowering and enriching students, parents, children, as well as community college, uh, the college community and also the early childhood community. Well, the question is what challenges have they actually faced given the fact that we've had a COVID-19 pandemic? Here now to share a little bit more is the executive director at Bronx Community College's Early Childhood Center, Jatinder Walia. And then also we are, we also have with us uh, from Bronx Community College liberal arts major, Doreen Ahuma. And thank you so much for joining us both. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And uh, I guess I'll start first with Jatinder. And Jatinder, um, I gave a little bit of an intro into the program, but for somebody who really uh, doesn't know the program, share a little bit about what BCC has uh, to offer in this program. Well, Bronx Community College Early Childhood Center is just an amazing place to be for children and families of the students of Bronx Community College. Um, you know, the, the children have a great time attending the childcare facility uh, with developmentally appropriate curriculum, with a social worker, with a family worker on site, with arts and crafts, with music teacher, we have a puppetry teacher. We have some amazing things that we do on an everyday basis with the families of our student parents. Um, it's exclusive to the student parents of Bronx Community College, so it is very special. Um, if you are a student uh, who is taking classes part-time, full-time, we are there for you. We are open from 7.30 to 10 o'clock at night, and we are also there on Saturday. So, and you know, we provide services if the students are taking midterms, they have finals, if they need extra services, um, for when they're doing their internships. So we do a lot of extracurricular stuff along with providing, um, and what makes it easy is that they drop their children off at the center and then they're right on campus. So if we need them, we can call them right away. And uh, what an amazing way for children to walk in school. Mommy is going to school, daddy's going to school, and we're going to school too, so. Right. And Doreen, give us a little bit about how the program has actually benefited you, uh, you being, uh a student and also a parent. Talk to us about how the program has benefited you. It has benefited me greatly and my child. I remember when I started, it was all confusing to me because I'm a single mom and I was wondering how I was going to manage schooling and I had to take math, which was very difficult for me. And I realized from the program that I could even drop my child after classes. It's not only for classes, and go for extra tutoring, which helped me a lot. And then the fact that the child is safe helps me when I drop him, I know he's safe. I don't have to worry about anything. And if, even if anything, they will take care of the child before I come was very good for me. I could concentrate on my studies. That was very, very good for me. So I benefited from the social work services because I had issues at the time. I was mourning my husband too. So I benefited from the social um, work services and then family services as well. And Jatinder, I want to talk about the fact that we are all still trying to navigate COVID-19. Uh, and as I said in the intro, uh, you know, your organization, is uh, the college has done a great job of having this program. But talk to me about how COVID-19 has impacted the work that you do. Um, it, you know, actually it was about March uh, 23rd when we went remote. Um, and stopped coming to the center. And quite honestly, it has been a journey, but I would be remiss if I don't say that none of this would have been possible without the support of an amazing administration. And I wanna call out my vice president, Dr. Irene Delgado, and the president of the college, Dr. Seknegbi, the support the Child Care Center has had from administration has enabled us to do so much. And as soon as the pandemic hit, and I have, an amazing team of staff that persisted in making sure that we were there for our children and families. Um, the minute the, the, the remote classes started, we had laptops, we had a Wi-Fi, we had the, the means, and the staff was trained really quickly into making sure that we were able to provide remote instruction to the children and families. I would say the first couple of weeks might have been a little bit rocky for some of the staff that needed to learn how to log on to Zoom and have a password and make sure everything was okay. But as we moved on, 
uh, we got better and better. We actually have our own YouTube channel where we uh, upload all the, the classes, the teachers read books to the children so that it was not just uh, giving them assignments, we were with them in their homes having Zoom classes at nine o'clock, at two o'clock, at 11 o'clock. Um, it might sound intrusive, but the children needed that. They needed that consistent face that they were familiar with. Um, you know, being on Zoom with their friends and saying hello to them, singing songs together, singing, uh, doing circle time together. So that was really, really a great thing. Not to say it's the same. I mean, you know, nothing can replace in-person childcare, but the fact that we were able to jump um, into remote learning and the kids did not miss seeing their teachers and friends was really helpful. And it was a lot of support from our um, team and, and just learning, you know, I mean, uh, you know, a, a good colleague of mine said recently, um, we are living at work, we are not working from home. And this transition is hard for each and every one of us. So we are just there to support each other in every way we can, you know, starting from having weekly wellness calls, just texting parents to ask, hey, are you okay? It's not just about you know, a lesson plan or what did we do for the children? But mommy, are you okay? Is there anything you need? Um, we transitioned very quickly into finding out what our parents' needs were. During this process, we had four drive-by uh, food drives, you know. We tried to maintain the consistent nature of the activities that we do. So every fall, we do uh, what's called a fall festival where children go trick-or-treating but we couldn't do it. So you know what we did? We did a drive-by uh, um, fall festival. So in their costumes and they came in the cars and drove by and we were all dressed up to give them the goodies. So those are the kind of transitions we made so they didn't miss out on some of the normal things. We sent a message from Santa to them via our YouTube channel. And then staff went personally to drop off gifts for the children. So that's just one of the things. I can go on and on, but um, I'm very proud of the team that I work with and the support that I have. Yeah, we'll have to have you back. And Doreen, we got to get out of the segment, but I want to ask you before we leave uh, very quickly, uh, is this a program that you recommend to other parents as well? Oh, sure, yeah. I would definitely recommend this program. I will recommend it 100%. I have benefited greatly even during the pandemic. I didn't love food because they were always sending me food. At, at a point, the team that had to bring the food herself because uh, I couldn't make it to the campus. So I will greatly recommend this program to any parent who is looking for, uh, who is thinking about going to school and you think um, you have a child and you are looking for a place to take your child, the BCC daycare is the best place to take your child. You will not regret it. Well, we got to leave it there, Jatinder and Doreen. Thank you so much for being with us here on this segment of Open and continue the great work of uh, helping children as well as parents. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Certainly. Well, listen, we want to let you know if you want more information, please visit their website at bcc.cuny.edu forward slash BCC kids, or you can call them at 718-289-5335. Again, 718-289-5335. We encourage you don't go anywhere. We've got more open coming up. We're coming right back right after this. Who's most at risk for coronavirus? People over 65, people with underlying medical conditions like heart disease, chronic lung disease, asthma, diabetes, people undergoing cancer treatment, and people with weakened immune systems. What should you do if you or a loved one is at higher risk? Avoid close contact with people. Avoid crowds. Stay home if you can. Wash your hands frequently. Learn more ways to protect yourself and others at coronavirus.gov.
And welcome back. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused many individuals to put their physical health first, as well as their mental health. The Advanced Holistic Center is an integrative medicine facility and is stated to be the New York corporate world's first choice for acupuncture, gua sha cupping, as well as other blends of Western and traditional Chinese medicine. The center is opening a new location in order to meet their customers' needs. And joining us now to share a little bit more and provide insight is the founder of Advanced Holistic Center, Dr. Irina Logman. And uh, thank you, Dr. Logman, for being with us. Hello, and thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be with you as well. Thank you. And so you're, you're starting this center, looking to meet your uh, customers' needs. Talk to us a little bit about what's gonna be offered. Actually, I had an invitation um, from Miami, from my wellness hotel, which is a Carolyn hotel. They were looking for somebody who can provide Chinese medicine in their facility. And I was talking to my patients who were slowly moving towards Florida state uh, from New York City because the state of New York is not doing as well and corporate people are staying home. It's very hard for them to work from home. And Miami offered a little bit more freedom to them. So the timing uh, came very amazingly perfect in sync with universe and my ideas. And in Florida, we're gonna have exactly the same services as in New York City, maybe even a little bit more because I'm joining with this super high-end wellness spa who has high technology that I can combine the ancient traditional medicine, Chinese medicine with the uh, innovative modern technology that hotel offers. And so when we talk about alternative medicine, how many, what is it like in terms of uh, the turnover? Because people have used traditional methods for a long time. Talk to us about the rise in alternative medicine and how that's really, uh, you know, going right now. I will say that I've been in this business for over 15 years and I can definitely see a much uh, bigger acceptance. People always knew what acupuncture is and Chinese medicine is and it's uh, it's working. It worked for thousands of years. And this is the only reason it's still here is because it's working. Nobody's investing money into this craft. So it's surviving test of time because it's very effective. More people are getting to know that also insurance companies are covering the acupuncture in itself. So that's a big plus because people don't need to pay as much out of pocket for that. And um, with people sitting home and Western medicine not having enough modalities as a preventative medicine, I see a lot more people reaching out, and especially like you mentioned for the mental health. Um, some people are okay with taking medications and some people would like to take something different. So Chinese medicine, especially acupuncture in itself, balances body out and the young people, especially the millennials, they are so open to it. They keep asking for different modalities and different ways of sustaining their balance of physical, wellness and the mental wellness. Walk us through a little bit about what is actually acupuncture. Many of us are familiar, some are not familiar. So if somebody doesn't know about acupuncture, explain. Acupuncture is um, needle puncturing the skin. This is a direct translation of the acupuncture. Uh, the needles are placed in specific areas of the body that are known to have a specific effect. So there is a function and indication to every point and they can be in different body parts. So if you have a headache, we can be needling the point on your hand. This is uh, an empirical point for headaches. It moves energy from where it's not enough or where it's too much to where it's not enough. It makes everything flow. The pain comes from lack of flow. Let's say if you have a bruise, there is a stagnation and there is pain. If you get it out of your system, it, the body cleans the bruise, there is no more pain. The, the whole idea of acupuncture is the movement of energy. And when ener energy moves, blood moves, and there is no pain, and there is balance and health. Talk to us about gua sha. Gua sha is um, also a very ancient technique, and uh, currently chiropractors actually use very similar technique in the cold grasping. It's pretty much taking any object that has a round edge, so you don't want to damage the skill, and sliding it along the muscle fibers to break the adhesions. It creates a lot of um, blood flow to the surface, and um, you can see a lot of coloring in the skin. It can be red, and can be purple, and coloring is also indicative of what's happening underneath, whether it's cold or whether it's heat or whether it's just blood stasis underneath. And you pretty much just scrape the meridian or scrape the body uh, part or muscle. You can just go along the deltoid to create, to open up the adhesions and create the flow. It's a topical application. Yeah, and then we also hear about cupping. What is cupping? 
cup, it gets famous. It's creating negative pressure and then became very popular since Michael Phelps came uh, during the Olymp Olympics with the round marks on his back. It separates, like gua sha pushes into the tissue and cupping actually separates and opens up more flow. So it, you put a cup on, now we're using uh, suction pops instead of fire that creates vacuum in the cup. You lift the skin, you lift the fascia, you create the space for the blood to go under. The same thing, you kind of break up the adhesions and you stimulate the immune system, like a systemic effect. And so you'll be opening up a new location. Let's talk about where that location will be. Miami Beach. <laughs> yes. There is a lot of demand, actually. I've met a lot of people. I am in Miami right now, and uh, a lot of people from New York and New Jersey are here. Most of my new friends are from New York and New Jersey, and they all went to acupuncture in New York City, to somewhere in Koreatown, on Upper East Side, and now they're here, and like, I don't know where to go. So timing is perfect, and I think uh, it's a great idea to be able to treat it's the same people, you know, it's they, I feel like there are no boundaries anymore. The global, the world has opened up. We can travel so easily. So people work from New York, people work from Florida. So they can see uh, us in New York, they can see us in Florida and get the same quality of care. So Miami Beach, uh, Carolyn Hotel is the primary location at this point. I do think we're gonna have more than one location in Florida because the demand is pretty high. I have a lot of people asking already. We are about to open. It's not functioning yet because I'm just setting up the location, but um, 6799 Collins Avenue. Yeah. Hmm. Excited for it? Super excited. Honestly, I'm probably, I mean, I've been, I've been in New York City for many years and I love New York City. It's so busy, so intense. And I'm in Miami. It's a much slower vibe. People are really oriented towards wellness. They, especially on this hotel, it's a wellness hotel. It used to be Canyon Ranch. So the whole facility gives you an experience. I'm on a beach. In between patients, you can go take a swim in the ocean. You can sit and meditate and have fresh air. It's really, really amazing. You can probably see my excitement, yeah? I, I can see I can see the excitement. I can see the smile. I see the short sleeves. I see us here in the snow and I see us <laughs> complaining. And so, yeah, we're living vicariously through you. So we're we're getting wellness through you even in this segment. And so for people who want to be connected, let's talk about your New York location. Um, and I know that you're still accepting uh, patients there as well. Oh, 100 percent. New York office is operating fully. It's on Wall Street. It's uh, Broadway and Wall. And uh it offers all the um, services. We also added recently with the COVID, actually COVID brought a lot more amazing practitioner, practitioners to my business because we need to unite to sustain ourselves to survive. So I have an amazing physical therapist as well on Wall Street and we coordinate our care with a chiropractor and a functional medicine doctor as well. So Wall Street is operating full time, seven days a week from eight in the morning till nine at night. Um, the Miami will probably over offer the same once we get going. Uh, for New York City, you can call 212-379-6414. You can also email us at admin at irenalogman.com. You can go to the website of advancedholisticcenter.com and click a button, schedule now, and we'll give you all possible um, time availabilities and services. You can select what you would like, but I highly recommend no matter what you need to address, starting with acupuncture, because from my personal experience as a practitioner and a patient, there is nothing better than acupuncture when it comes to alternative medicine. Everything else is a nice adjunct, but needles have, have magic. There is something magical that happens when you insert the needle into the human. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Logman. I can tell you're excited. And uh, yes, as I said, we're living vicariously through you. Uh, you're in Miami. You're also in New York. Dr. Irina Logman, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'll be with you anytime. All righty. Yep, we, we definitely want to learn more as well. And so if you want more information, what you can do is visit their website at advancedholisticcenter.com. Also, you can follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Advanced Holistic Center. Well, we've come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us, but most of all, you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch Recablecast on Bronxnet's Channel 67. If you have Optimum or Verizon Files, uh, that would be Channel 2133 on Verizon Files. Optimum, that's Channel 67. And anytime on the web at Bronxnet.org. Thank you for joining us here on Open. Until the next time we meet, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, and most of all, keep this channel wide open.